Hey everyone, I'm Coach Loretta and here with Coach Reese today with the Dirt Trail Running Podcast. Um, and today we are here with Coffee with Coaches with the Ornery Mule Coaching. So get ready for a great show and to learn some tips that you can take out on your run with you next time. So Reese, uh, what's up with you? Not too much. I actually, so this is going to wrap into the topic today pretty well. I just got back from the track. Um, I've been enjoying a lot of, you know, really fast interval runs. Um, I spent probably the past like three or four weeks just doing a bunch of volume and that's really awesome. It's really nice to get out there and just tune everything out and just be, you know, like in, in, in feel my body as I'm going down the road. Um, but it's also super fun. I find to like really dial in and just feel different intensities and feel those feelings on my body and work and breathe through different paces and know that like my body's not in danger, but I'm able to you know, produce some, some good paces and power and, and exertion, you know? So, um, that's, what's new with me, but, uh, what's new with you? Well, I've had my great nephews over for about a week. And so I've been doing a ton of cross training. They are 11 and almost 13. So they want to be active all day long, which is amazing because I love being outdoors and active. So we get up, we have done I don't know. I've played multiple rounds of disc golf. You get a lot of exercise in disc golfing, just walking the course and throwing. And and they're both um, really good baseball players. Amazing coaches. They've been coaching me like, Doretta, you need to hold the you know frisbee this way and you need to throw this way or you need to throw there or there. If I listen to them, I do much better than if I just throw it myself. So that's been cool. Um, we've been doing a lot of biking with them as well. Um, hiking. One day we took a trip to the lake near us to go to find a new disc golf course. Well, apparently I took them the long route. So it ended up being like a four mile hike. I thought I thought I was going to kill them, but we made it and we disc golfed like six rounds, came back and I gave the shorter route on the way back. They're like, you know, I'd rather just run this. So we did some trail running and you know, they are ball players, but I think they could make really good track and cross country runners too. They were like gazelles on the trail. So, so that was fun. Oh my gosh. That's amazing. I love too. like, I could just imagine you like going from like, you know, hole to hole, like speed walking is better. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes. Getting a <laughs> lot of time. Like I'm power hiking this, you yeah. know. Yeah. Well, and the thing is, so we start the day with, you know, disc golf, then we go on to biking and then we end the day with stand up paddle boarding where we have to go around the lake and troll for fish so we can see where all the bass are. Then they jump into their kayaks and then they fish until dark. So, so it's, you great. know what I love about that? Like thinking as life as training is like, you know, like sure, maybe like you weren't like running, running and like you weren't out there for like an hour, like training, you know, like using right. your pack and stuff like that. But like, the time with which you have to call upon your body to like make energy and be cognitively present. And then also like moving in a 3d fashion, whether you're paddle boarding or like looking underwater or doing all that other stuff. Like, you know, when we think about training, it's like, yeah, maybe you didn't run a step, but you gained a lot more in like fitness and like sure. overall, just like energy production during the day. It's what like Absolutely. in the science world we call NEAT or non-exercise activity thermogenesis is like, sure. It's not structured working out, but like, it's just, it's activity with which your body like has to make energy, which, you know, like the better we can create energy just on the fly, the better we can create energy while we're running. So. Right. Absolutely. And working on agility, you know, learning how to throw the disc golf. And we've been also um, at night before bed, binging the pro tour and watching mm -hmm. disc golf. And so we've been learning lots of uh, like, Oh, look how they throw it. Look how they run up to the, to, to throw. And so they, my great nephews again have been teaching me how to place my feet and you know run through to throw and and so that's and amazing you, i got two thoughts that. on that so i know carl meltzer the great uh the the goat the uh you know the the um the guy who the the speed goat shoe from hoka is named yeah. after yeah. he um you know 100 mile champion um is fantastic well he does a lot of speed golf now so oh, it's kind of like um what's that um biathlon where okay, you yeah. go and you like ski and you shoot. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of the same thing where it's like, you have to run to your ball and then you have to stop and you have to calm yourself and collect yourself so that you can accurately make a shot and then go run to your ball. So it's kind of like this like scoring system, but also like this time system of like, how long does it take you to complete that? So I could totally see you meshing that in with-, yeah. with I, I think golf. I'm gonna try this now. This is exciting. That might be our, our activity of the day, speed disc golf. <laughs> 
Yeah, for sure. It's like you can't go so hard because right. then you get you, you get there, your heart's pounding, you can't concentrate and accurately throw, but right. you can't just like waltz around, you know? Yeah, I love it. And you know, the course you get in about three miles of, you know, through the, di the disc golf course. So it would be a good actually training. So yeah, that's fantastic. If anybody tries that, you know, drop a comment for us. We're going to see how that goes. <laughs> Sweet. Well, okay. So on to the topic. I, um, I had an athlete tell me the other day, um, and I thought it would be an amazing topic for today is, you know, like, Hey, like I, I, you know, I'm doing more interval training. I'm doing more strides, but I have such a hard time thinking when I see my average pace on my runs on Strava. Um, I have a hard time thinking that I'm getting faster when those average paces are going down. So, you know, this athlete in particular is training for a triathlon, um, you know, she's been putting in a lot of volume on the bike. We've been doing a lot of brick workouts where, you know, you run off of the bike and stuff like that. And I've been having to do a lot of strides, um, strides, as we know, are really good for, bi for biomechanics, for speed development, for shaking out the legs after a, after a, a bike ride effort, as well as for developing your upper end aerobic capacity in just small incremental doses. But when we run those strides, you know, we'll go for maybe like two, three miles or so, maybe four tops where you do like a mile warm up, a mile cool down, and then like five or six strides in between where you pick up for 30 seconds at like, you know, a 5K pace. And then you spend two minutes either just walking around or, you know, doing a little bit of like active mobility things, kind of like some high knees as you're walking down the road. Um, so when you do those, you know, your average pace for the entire run will look a lot slower right. than um, your, your other runs that you're used to, right? So- right. Um, but it's just interesting because, um, when we see this average pace thing on Strava, um, it can kind of get into our head and say, oh man, like if my average paces for my interval runs like that are going down, like how am I actually getting faster? I think like those stride runs that she was doing, it's like she was averaging, you know, probably like a minute to a minute and a half per mile slower right. than her other typical runs. Because of that recovery she's... in between, right, right. Yeah, because that recovery, you know, drops that pace down. Right. Um, to which I assured her, like, don't worry about it. Like the um, the work that you do inside of the run is what's making you better, not your average right. pace overall. So I kind of just wanted to like open this discussion and kind of lead us down different rabbit holes of what do you tell your athletes when they look at you and they say, man, like these intervals are cool. Like I'm working hard, but like, my average pace is a lot slower. How the heck am I getting faster? How can I run faster during my race? Then? Right. Um, I guess take this where you will, Loretta. Let's hear uh, yeah, some good expertise. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think average pace is all relative, right? Into what the workout is. You know, we have an average pace if we're doing a recovery run, which may be just, you know, it's going to be quite a bit slower than your race pace, maybe one or two minutes, you know, slower than that. So you're, you know, that's where you want to be, right? And I think we get caught up sometimes in, thinking about our average race pace, maybe for the triathlon or, or especially if we're doing some shorter things like um, a marathon or I call some marathon shorter, but you know, it's relative, all relative when we're thinking about ultra, right? And so when we're thinking about maybe your average pace for a marathon is seven minute pace, but you're, uh, and that's during the race, right? But during your training easy runs, maybe it's more like 830 pace, nine, you know, nine minute pace. So I think average pace is all relative to the work that you're doing, right? Or your long run may look a little bit different. And then your intervals are going to be more like, um, you know, maybe 630 pace, you know, so you're looking at, you know, those different things. So I think that one, you know, looking at Strava and comparing it with other people is dangerous. So that would be one thing that I would tell my athletes is, you know, like kind of Look at the work that you're doing with inside side your, your workout, not just focusing on average pace. It's just one piece of data that you can get from your workout, right? Um, it's interesting because um, I had in our lo local running group, somebody had posted about being frustrated with interval work because they couldn't, they didn't know when to stop and start. So one of the things that I would suggest to my athletes, a lot of times when we're doing interval work is I teach them how they can program their watch. Um, I have a Garmin, so I'm more, you know, proficient in Garmin, but Coros is very similar, which is the two most popular watches I think my athletes have. So I can still show them, you know, how to set up your, the workout that they're going to do. So if it maybe starts out with that mile um, of, of, you know, at an easy pace, right? So that you're going to be able to dissect your data a little bit and go, okay, I'm running this easy pace at 
nine minute, but then when I'm into my intervals, now I'm going to set up my strides. So I'm going to do some repeats in there with, you know, five 20 second strides with a two minute recovery in between your watch can, you know, be programmed to show you all that. So then when you go back and look at your data, you can see those data sets, right? So then you can see your strides. They were seven, seven minute pace or six minute pace or whatever you wanted, you know, them to be. And then you'd see that slow pace, which might be 15 minute pace because you're, you know, just recovering in between. But all of those um, times that we're talking about are important part of your um, progression and getting faster and being able to run farther, right? So you want to make sure that you're hitting some of those pieces and not so much focusing on the overall. At the end of that workout, you're going to still get an average pace, but that's really meaningless when we look at those pieces and we chunk them down. Is that is that kind of where you're going? Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's important to say too, like what you're getting at is like, we need to have accurate data, right? Yes. Like, I've Absolutely. heard of some people going out and not lapping their watches, but just kind of looking for like you know, for 400 meters, like, oh, like about w what kind of pace am I running right now? And you never really know if you're looking down and you're running like your fastest pace at 400 meters yes. or your slowest pace, like, cause you really don't know what the average is unless you're lapping your watch. And for anybody that doesn't know what a lap is, it's really um, just a, a chunk. So let's say um, the, the workout is um, four 400 meter um, intervals. So you're going to do 400 meters on and 400 meters off. So every time you cross that start finish line, you hit the lap button on your watch and it will kind of like capture that one 400 meter run that you did. It'll give you your average pace. It'll also give you your average heart rate. Um, and then you, the next, when you're going around your recovery, you're kind of jogging and then you hit that start stop line and you hit that again and that's your lap. So your lap button is kind of like your start stop for your intervals um, during your overall run. So every time you cross that start stop, you're going to lap it. And then when you're looking back at your runs, you can say, oh, yeah, for that 400 meter chunk, I actually did run this particular pace. Right. So in, on my watch, the way that I have it set up is I have my like I'm on my lap screen. I have my lap average pace and then I have my current pace. Mm -hmm. So what I can see is that, hey, my lap average pace is to make the numbers easy is 10 minutes a mile. And then my current pace is 11 minutes a mile. That means that lap average pace is going to start to climb upwards right, right. unless I start running a little bit faster, you know, right. so it's kind of yeah. an easy way to gauge like how hard am I going right now versus how hard am I going on average. Yeah. So, so I um, think, yeah, so I think lap pace is one way to do it. So you can do it manually during your run. So you're clicking that, pushing that. Yeah. I um, get a little crazy with that and sometimes I forget. <laughs> so for me, <laughs> I found that it's better to pre-program it. So I go into, for me, Garmin, I use Garmin Connect. I developed the entire, app, you know, um, workout and I've even walked some of my athletes through this by sending them screenshots of, okay, this is what it's going to look like. So you're going to have a warm up, then you mm -hmm. might put in some intervals and you, you know, you can set intervals by time or by distance. And, you know, as your workout changes and some, some workouts, you know, have a lot of variability in them, right? So you might have a warm up, you might have strides, then you might go into an interval workout and then go back to you know, a recovery run, you know, so you can program that all. So all you do is click start workout on your watch and you never touch anything again. It's, it's guiding you through your workout. And then yeah. you can, again, get the same kind of data that Reese was talking about where you're looking at each piece separately and you know, all those splits. Cause I used to be really stubborn and go, I don't need to program it. I don't need to split it. I can just watch my watch and watch the time. But I felt like I spent so much time looking at my watch, knowing when to start and stop. And then sometimes I would get like little snapshots of going, oh, I'm going at this pace when in actuality, I probably wasn't. And then at the end of my run, when I wanted to go look at my data, it was all clumped into one big average pace. And it gave me really no information that I wanted, you know, that was really usable. Right. So so by doing that is a really good way, I think, to make give you a good check of where you're at. You know that you're hitting those. And I like to do them for for tempo runs too at times, because then I can really look at like, okay, if I'm going to do a 20 minute tempo, I can break my workout out into, okay, here's my warm up, then here's my 20 minute tempo. And then here's my cool down. And I can see where was I at during that tempo? And what was my heart rate during that time? So I can see, was I actually at tempo or threshold or was I running too fast or a little too slow? You know, you can just use that data for so much, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm, I'm for sure on the same page as you. I really like the like the, the, the workout, like to be pre-programmed if it's not going to be like on a track or something like that. Mm -hmm. I, the only problem is like on a track, 
is that sometimes your GPS will read yes, like, and, and cor like, so I have a Coros and it is fantastic. And it has a track lap feature where it'll kind of like pin you to a track and you mm -hmm. tell it what lane you're in and what lane you plan on running in. And it can get very accurate, but every once in a while, I'd say every, you know, like a, in a 10 mile run, it might be off like by a 10th uh, or like a hundredth yeah. of a mile, like yeah. every couple laps or so. Um, but when I cross that 400 meter mark, like, I want to lap my watch because yes, like, it doesn't matter what the GPS says. I just want to pay attention to like what that average pace was or how long it took, how many seconds. Definitely. It took, you know? yep, so yep. I think there's a time and there's a place. And one thing yep. that I always tell my athletes too, is that like they can program their watch to run them through a workout that I give them for sure. I can program, uh, um, you know, their, their watch to, to run them through a workout. But I do think there is something when we're training for ultra marathons to, be mentally aware instead of just waiting for that watch to ding to think mm -hmm. like okay like i have a 20 minute tempo so like i'm going to start the first five minutes and like i know that it's going to be a long time i don't need to look at my watch until like i feel like it's been about 10 minutes or so because i don't want that feel and right. i want people to like stay engaged with like oh how far am i like into my um into it because there's there's so often um there's so many times where it's like your brain just kind of turns off and you just kind of go and it's like yeah that's great but like when we're running ultra sometimes we got to dial it back in reel it back in we got to learn how to zone out and then zone back in and say okay how how much longer do i have here like and then in case of ultra marathons it's like okay how wh when is the next aid station have i eaten yet like what do i okay. need is there trash i need to put in my hand things like that so i think there's pros and cons to doing it either way um, for anybody that it makes it really easy for, like if that is the best way and that is a foolproof way that you're going to run your workouts and know that you're going to run them right, like definitely do that then, you know, but I always tell my athletes, if you can manually do it, like I like that because it makes you zone back into what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Right, so, right. But yeah, it's just a difference in philosophy. So whatever yeah, works better for the athlete is absolutely fine. I think so too. And then, you know, I have athletes that really aren't into the data and the, um, the technology. So, you know, there's a, a piece of going by feel too. So we don't always have to know our stats, but for people who want to know those, that that's a great way to do it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I, so let's, so let's, let's go back to this, this whole like psychology piece of like my average run pace is getting slower, but I'm hitting all my splits that my coach wants me to do in my faster intervals. How the heck do I rationalize that I'm actually getting faster? What's going on during the workout, Loretta, that's not reflected in our average pace? Well, you know, you have all of the, those different pieces, right, of the, maybe it's the 400. So you're going to have a fast piece of 400, then you're going to have a slow, because, you know, in between, we really want to, depending on what the workout and when the focus is, we may really want you to get down, back down to your um, low heart rate before you go again, you know, really recover. And so you're going to have this big portion of slow which really isn't your average pace it, but it's slowing down your overall average pace because it's averaging everything you do together yeah and that's that's absolutely right i you know like the way that i think about this i think that the work inside of the run itself is more important than the average run right absolutely so like today i did um i did some threshold running i did six by a mile with a 400 meter jog in between and when i say jog i mean like i was barely shuffling yes yeah. um because in my mind the important piece was that I hit those mile splits at what I intended to hit those mile splits at. And the way that I figured out what I want or what I was capable of hitting those mile splits in was I, you know, looked at my previous race performance and, and kind of like reverse engineered it to say like, oh, well, if I can run a half marathon at this average pace, then my lactic threshold should be around here. So I'm going to try to target these. Um, so what I did was I ran a mile. I held that pace as best as I could. That mile ended. I lapped my watch and then I jogged as easily as I could because it was hot outside. So I was thinking to myself, hey, like I'm doing 10 minute miles here, 11 minute miles, which is almost double my half marathon pace. But like the important thing is, is that um, my heart rate is coming down and I'm getting prepared during that 400 meter, um, that 400 meter rest to go and hit it again hard and make sure that I'm recovered. So right. then when I zoom out and I'm done with the entire workout, I complete the six miles at my intended pace. I do all the recoveries. I don't focus on how fast the recovery is because again, recovery is meant to be slow enough so that you recover for the next interval round. So right. now as I zoom back and I look at my, my average pace, I go, Hmm. Yeah. 
it was definitely a lot. The workout itself was a lot harder than if I would have ran just that average pace for right, 10 months. Right, right. Absolutely, absolutely. So, think, yeah. So, you know, when you're thinking about that, right, and you're breaking down your, when you're really reflecting back on your run, right? Let's mm -hmm. see, we just did an interval workout and we're reflecting on that. And we're looking at the data that you might see in Strava, you know, thinking about um, that average pace is something that I probably don't even really look at in an interval workout, right? I might use that more in a long run or more in my recovery run because it's going to be more of a consistent pace that I'm going to maintain throughout that run or in a race. You know, I'm going to look at that. But when I'm doing intervals or tempos, I'm definitely not really looking at average. I'm really looking at, okay, what did each of those pieces that were my goals look like you know how did my strides look individually how did my um intervals look individually and was i recovered in between because i wouldn't want to i wouldn't want to skew the average pace by increasing my pace to warm up and to cool down because that would right bump that average pace up but it wouldn't be doing me good purpose it'd be putting me probably running more in that gray zone right not that easy effortless zone that we want to be at the beginning and the end of that workout right and then those pieces in between, we want to be looking at, you know, am I, let, let's see, when we're talking about some of the stuff we're talking about right now, we're talking about more like getting into that VO2 max, that high heart rate, eight to 10 effort, right? You're, you're really pushing that max. So when I go back and look at that, I want to see, did I, you know, where was I? How did my, how did my heart rate look during that time? You know, and then also reflecting personally, like, how did I feel? What was my rate of perceived exertion? Did I feel like my heart rate showing me, did I feel like I was working at that eight to 10 effort or, or was it a little bit easier than I, than it, than I thought it should have been, you know, should I have pushed a little bit harder? So I think looking at that, and then I'm going to go down just a little rabbit hole because this is something I learned this summer. So I got a new watch <laughs> and I'm wearing this watch and I'm going, why is my, my heart rate ridiculously high? Like every run I'm like hitting 200 in my heart rate. And I'm like, that, that just seems extreme. So I ended up contacting the company, which happens to be Coros. And I asked them, I'm like, Hey, what, what's going on? You know, why is my heart rate like this? So they had me send a GPX fi file of one of my runs to them. And they're like, okay, what I think is going on here is you have cadence lock. So my cadence is around 200. I have a pretty high cadence. So 200, 203. So when I'm seeing heart rates of that, it was pairing and it was the, like, it was picking up the noise of my cadence over my heart rate. And so then all of a sudden, you know, I'm thinking, whoa, what's wrong with me? Why is my, even my easy runs, why does everything look so, you know, like I'm working really hard. So I think that if you're, you're seeing heart rates that are crazy like that, take a look at your data. You can look inside of your data and you can shut off pace and uh, other things and just look at heart rate and cadence. And if they're really lining up, it's potential that you may have the same thing. And so it, I had a few athletes on my, um, that I've been coaching that I couldn't understand why their heart rates always looked really high and always consistently, you know, you know, at a number that just didn't make sense to me because I knew that their fitness level was different than what their heart rate was showing, but I didn't really know what was going on. And so once I went back and I looked, I did, I went back and looked at everybody's data because I was very curious then because I had a few people that came to mind when they said that. And I'm like, oh my gosh, they have the exact same thing going on. So what Coral re Coral's recommended, and I think it might be because I have a smaller wrist, they recommended me putting my watch on the inside of my wrist instead of the outside. And it worked, it changed and my data looked better and it's worked for my athletes too. So if you're seeing that and feeling a little frustrated, it could be that that's going on. And I did research it on the internet. It's a thing, cadence lock, which who knows? I don't think it's just exclusive to Coros. I'm sure it happens in Garmin's watches too, or other, you know, GPS watches. It just happened to happen in the Coros and I noticed it. And I think that comes back to this idea that like, you know, we can use these types of tools yes. to like help inform us, um, but they shouldn't be the only tools that we have, right? Like we should never yes. be just focusing on heart rate. We should never just be focusing on power or whatever your metric is, it's check in with your effort. Like, Hey, is, like I, I always send my athletes, I wrote out like a couple page document. I call them my, my running terms, you know, like what is tempo pace? What does it 
feel like? What are you going to be, yes. you know, tasting in your mouth? How is your breathing going to be? What is your effort going to feel like? I always send that out to my athletes. So that way when they read it, you know, then mm -hmm. they know that like, oh, like a tempo pace is this yeah. type of effort. And then when I go and I program them workouts, I say like, hey, seven out of 10 pace. Remember, you're going to be breathing heavy, but not all out. You should be able to keep good form, but it's going to be faster than usual. Um, you should be able to speak like three or four words, you know, like not crazy hop, like hopping and puffing, something that you could sustain for about an hour, but we're only going to do it for this 20 minute chunk, things like that, you know, yeah, so it's not 20 absolutely. minutes all out. Um, so when an athlete is then going and running their run, um, and then, and then I'll also give them like, Hey, you might want to keep it between like, you know, 155 to 165, depending on the athlete for a tempo run or whatever. Right, right. Um, and so that way, like when they're out there, they can say like, okay, am I within 155 to 165? Cool. I am. That's awesome. Do I feel the things that Reese yes. told me I should yes. be feeling? Yes. yes. Okay, cool. All my tools are telling me that I'm in the correct um, effort level. Yeah. Now, if you're like, man, I feel like I'm in the correct effort level because of what Reese described to me, I should be feeling I'm feeling, but now my watch says I'm at 200. Like, yeah. what the heck? Like, and that's where I was, right? I'm like, I could sing, I could talk. I felt amazing. Why am I at 203? <laughs> Something's <yep>. not right. <laughs> Exactly. And too, like that can all wrap back into this idea of like, you know, like sometimes your interval work, like I always tell people like running fast doesn't have to mean running hard, you right. know? So when I have people do strides and you know, they're like, man, I was really cooked afterwards. It's like, well, you did four or five strides. Like, why do you feel cooked afterwards? Because you have good consistent volume. Like you're a consistent runner. Um, you know, like, oh, I, I went like, I went 45 seconds, like all out as hard as I could. And it was like, oh, awesome. But like, read that term sheet that I gave you. Remember a stride is 30 seconds. The first 10 seconds, you're building into that like 5K effort. And then you're holding that 5K effort for 10 seconds. And then the last 10 seconds, you're ramping back down. So, um, you know, it's it's like, you know, when we're running these these intervals, sometimes it's a lot easier to, to, to overdo them. Like we need mm -hmm. to train, we don't need to strain right? Maybe you can run um, a mile like crazy fast. Maybe you're like a miler in five minutes flat or something like that. And so I tell you like, Hey, I want you to go out and do mile repeats at six minutes for sure. You can absolutely do them faster. We know that you're capable of a five minute mile and I'm asking you to do them at six minutes for sure. But you could bust all those out in five thirties or whatever. Mm -hmm. But the thing is, is maybe that's a little bit too taxing on the body. Maybe the work that you're putting in is going to make the recovery a lot longer than if you did go 30 seconds a mile, a little bit slower. A good example is an athlete that I've been working with. Um, he just ran Badger 50K. If he listens to this, he's gonna know exactly who he, who, who he is. Um, um, I just think he's he's the man. He's super great. Um, he's a grad student. Um, he's fantastic. He's got great energy. Um, but I've been really trying to talk with him and hammer in that easy pace of like, hey, when we're going out and we're running these intervals, like we're gonna be doing a lot of progression runs coming up. Right. So he is going to be starting and like, I want him warm in his typical easy run. Like he'll do a 15 mile long run at like, you know, like an eight minute pace or so. So like during these progression runs, I'm having him start at a 10 minute pace. Mm -hmm. And then I'm having him like edge down every, every few miles or so until he gets, he's basically going to be finishing the run at his, at his easy pace. Um, so I like, I want him doing that because he's going to be running his first 50 mile. And I was like, dude, you like, we need to get your body prepared for what that 50 mile pace feels like, you know? So when he's going out and he is like running his like, you know, average runs or whatever is his average pace he sees on Strava is going to be way down compared to what he's, what he's capable of. Right, it's right. going to mentally freak him out. But I keep telling him like, Hey man, like your average pace might be going down. But don't worry about it because we're making you a better 50 mile runner. Right. Like, Dude, you got, you ha he has an amazing top end. We don't need to worry about that anymore. We need to worry about his all day pace. I want to make, because he's like, you know, oh, 10 minutes a mile is just like, doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel natural. Right. And that's great. But when he's going to be running this 50 mile race, guarantee the fastest, it, like right. his average run is probably going to be 10 mile or 10 minutes a mile to 12 minutes a mile. Right. So right. If he's not comfortable doing that in training then we're not practicing race specificity because right. that's about what he's going to be running in that 50 mile race for sure. So, um, in that case, I, I told him, I was like, man, don't worry about your average pace. 
because it, it's going to go down, but you're going to be a better 50 mile runner after that. And don't worry if we transition to something faster down the road, like you already put in all of this amazing amount of base mileage. Since he's taking a lot of it slower too, his recovery is just going to go through the roof. So all of that is just to wrap back in and say like, you know, average pace only tells half of the story because even though his average pace is going down, he's working on his biomechanics. He's working on his economy. He's working on specific 50 mile paces, you know? And then we have some other runs where he's going to be running a little bit faster for sure. Um, but that's where like average pace doesn't really tell the whole story. Right. What are you training for? Like what kind of work was inside of that workout? Um, because you never like the average pace isn't the stimulus that makes your body better. It's right. just like the summary of the workout, you know, right, just like a summary of a book. It doesn't give you exactly what was in the book. You know what I mean? It gives you a brief snapshot of like, oh, this is about what, what it was about. Right. But right. what is the, what, what are the meat and potatoes of what was inside of the run? That's what's important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, you know, I think you brought up some great things. So, you know, when you're talking about pace again, and we're talking about average pace and you're talking about having somebody run a mile that could run it at five minute, but you're asking them to run it at six minute or whatever. Right. I think that's sometimes that we get wrapped up in. I don't know if we're trying to prove ourselves, are we were trying to prove it to the world in Strava or ourselves personally and go pushing ourselves a little bit harder than we should be. And we're really not getting the benefits of that, right? So I think really important when you're thinking about some of the workouts that you're doing, whether it's intervals or tempos, that you're really sticking to some of those numbers rather than saying, hey, I got this, I got went way faster than you told me to. That really wasn't the point of it, right? So, you know, if I have an athlete that runs a run, I give them a time, you know, around because I'm looking at the data that they have and that's how I'm coming up with where I think that it makes sense for them to be focusing that pace. And then they tell me they ran it like, I don't know, 30 seconds faster. You know, it really wasn't, I think they think it was more beneficial because they could run faster or maybe they were trying to show me they could run faster, but that really wasn't the intention of the workout. You know, yeah. so I think, I think that happens. I think that happens with all of us, right? I mean, I'm sure I'm guilty of it too. Like, oh, well, I can run faster than that. When, when we talk about like metabolism and fatigue, so let's take the, the half marathon distance because that's pretty tightly correlated to your lactate threshold. Um, we talked about this a lot and just to kind of like go over and review with people, like no matter who you are out there, think about what your half marathon pace is. If you've never run a half marathon pace, think about what your 10K pace is. That's going to be pretty close. Um, but let's take your half marathon pace. That is your lactate threshold. So for some people that might be seven minutes a mile, some people that might be eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, whatever it might be, think about what yours is. And then what you can do is say, when you're running your 20 minute tempo runs, you don't want to be going any faster than that. Ideally, you want to be going 10 to 20 seconds a mile, 30 seconds a mile, depending like if you're north of 10 minutes a mile for your half marathon pace, um, slower than that. Cause that's when we're really going to be getting that lactate shuttle system on board. Now, like we said, um, your half marathon pace is going to be like fairly close to your lactate threshold pace. Mm -hmm. um, so it's going to be about like what you can sustain for like an hour to an hour and a half. So like, let's say you're doing your 10 K in an hour, then that 10 K is going to be closer to your lactate threshold. So that's why I mentioned that 10 K piece before. Yep. So think about what is your hour to hour and a half like race pace. Um, for most of us, that's going to be half marathon pace. Um, but now if you run faster than that for 20 to 30 minutes or so, you're going to be incurring a lot more fatigue than if you were running a little bit slower than that for 20 to 30 minutes, but you're still going to be getting the same adaptation signal. So this is that work smarter, not work harder, because if you can go a little bit slower and get the same benefit as if you were to go a little bit faster, you're just not going to have to recover as long. You're going to be able to bounce back a lot quicker and be able to put in another effort like that. Um, you know, as opposed to if you go just a little bit too hard, you know, you might, you know, be able to complete the workout a little bit faster, but you're going to be like put under so much fatigue that you might not fully recover by the next time you have a harder workout. And then after weeks of doing that, you run yourself down into a hole. You're not completely recovering. And now we're kind of in that, like, Oh, we need to take an unplanned rest week because, you can't get enough sleep. Your body's exhausted, like thinking hurts and life is suffering, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's where like, like if we ask you to run 20 minutes at a pace that you can theoretically sustain for like an hour to an hour and a half, of course, you're going to be able to do it. Of right. course, you're going to feel like you're able to go faster. 
but should you? Absolutely not, you know? So, yeah. and let's and those just are, those are hard always workouts that, you know, like, I, I definitely believe that, you know, there should be a hero workout in there every once in a while, you know what I mean? Just to like really prove to yourself, like, hey, what am I capable of? Um, but those are very far and few in between. And those are in particular times leading up to bigger events. So unless your coach tells you like, hey, hero workout, I want you to go smash 30 minutes as hard as you possibly can. Like, you know, then, then you got to take those pacing guidelines really well and really listen to the effort that the coach wants out of it. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Awesome. Well, so, you know, are, are there any like last things that you want to talk about as far? I, I think we did a good job at explaining like, you know, that average pace doesn't reflect the stress that your body has actually like been put under right. during the workout. And by stress, I just mean the signal that you're sending to your body to get better, right? Like if right, we right. run a bunch of VO2 max intervals, you're going to be signaling your body to get better at VO2 max paces. If you run a bunch of lactate threshold intervals, you're going to be signaling your body um, to increase its lactate threshold. So um, the work that you put in within the workout does not reflect exactly. the average pace. So exactly. is, is there any, any last minute um, things that you wanted to say about the topic? Um, I think I just want to go back and say, you know, I love what you said about like not just relying on the data. So I think I think we should say that again, you know, really relying on also listening to your body, because that's going to be the, your most important piece, right, to learn, like, what does it feel like if I'm running easy? What does it feel like if I'm putting in a really hard effort? And what's it feel like if I'm putting in more of a tempo lactate threshold effort? I think it's just really good for us to learn that because it's going to be helpful in our race. We're, like if we're running a 50 mile race, we're not going to be wanting to look at the watch all day long. And we know heart rate at that point, you know, with, with um, cardiac drift, it's not going to be really reliable. So we really need to learn to listen to our body and how we're feeling so that we can maintain those, the effort that we should be during a long, especially ultra endurance effort. Absolutely. So for everybody out there, don't get caught up in average pace. Don't caught up, get caught up in the gray zone, get caught up in what is inside of your workout. Or if it's an easy run, just go out there and run easy. Don't even pay attention to your average pace. Any, yep, any absolutely. Pace. Know the intention yeah. of your workout, you know, why sure. the reason why you're doing what you're doing so that you can you know, and maybe make it easier for you to maintain the paces that you're, you know, trying to hit. Yeah. You know, actually, you know, Loretta, before we sign off, what do you think about this? This just came to mind. I think the only time that watching your average pace is acceptable is in a specific long run for a race or the race itself. Yeah, say yeah, if yeah, you're, say if you're running a 50 K, right. And we're going to say, I want you to go out and I want you to run 20 to 26 miles um, the first 10 are going to be a nice warm up, And then the last 15, 16, whatever it is, try to hold your expected pace for your mm -hmm. 50 day or yep. for your, um, or for your 50 mile. Right. I think then lapping your watch and looking at that chunk and then reflecting and saying, what did this feel like? Can I sustain this for an entire 50 K or 50 mile? I think that's fair. Yeah, I think that's fair too. You know, I, that's one of a workout that I may have an athlete do is kind of what I call like a fast finish, right? So you might be doing a long run and maybe the last five miles are at race pace. You know, let's, I have somebody training for a marathon. That's something that we're working on is that long run, that last piece, a fast finish at pay, marathon pace. And then thinking about how do I feel? Is that, you know, something that's a, a maintainable effort for me? And I think it's yeah. also just good, so good mentally sometimes to hit some of those, like you talked about, those race pace efforts so yeah. that we know what that feels like and we feel can go into a race feeling confident that I can maintain that yeah. effort. Okay, podcast not over because I want to go down another rabbit hole. Uh oh, um, See, th this is how race my coffee, conversations coffee, always go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so, so if you're training, so a lot of the most like elite marathoners, when they are training for a particular finish, say, like 205 or sub or whatever it is. And the only reason I mention this is because we can get a lot of training theory insights from what the best people in the world are doing. That doesn't mean that you have to be the best in the world. It just means that like, hey, there are some of these principles that can trickle down and affect everybody. Um, mm -hmm. Because the people who are running at the top also have all the funding and the science and the research and the team to help them be the best, right? So they're probably training the way bodies like to be trained the best too. Right. Gold standard. Um, at least they're at the cutting edge of science. And what they are doing 
let's say, um, you know, if you want to run an average of five minutes per mile for your marathon, that'd be a pretty, pretty good and elite time. Um, you don't train specifically and only at five minutes per mile for all of your runs, right? Like you don't see an elite marathoner who's trying to finish in like, you know, 215 or like 220 or something like that. Just go out and smash their easy runs, their long runs, their interval runs at an average of five minutes per mile, right? Like they're going to have their easy days where they're going like eight, nine minutes a mile, 10 minutes a mile, whatever it is. They're going to have their interval days where maybe they're working on their speed. So they're doing like 430, you know, per mile paces with some rest and recovery in there. So it might average out to like six or seven minutes a mile for the entire workout. And then they have their long runs at the beginning of the block might be like, you know, six to seven minutes per mile average for like 15 to 20 miles. And then as they get closer to the marathon, then all of a sudden they start hitting their key workouts. They start hitting their key long runs and they'll have a key long run of like, okay, we're going to do like a six mile warm up. We're going to do a couple strides. Um, we're going to do a couple openers. And then the last like 10 miles or whatever is going to be at race pace. Um, and, and that's like, that's what they'll pay attention to. They'll pay attention to like, Hey, like I did the first 10 miles worth of stuff. Now I had the last 10 miles with my legs under fatigue. Was I still able to hold that pace and feel good doing it? Right, you know? right. yep. So that would be something to look like at average pace for, but you don't see these elite marathoners consistently clicking off their expected marathon pace every single workout. That's not the way that physiology works. You want to work paces both a little bit slower as well as a little bit faster. So that way on the day you can combine all that and get your average pace. Yeah. Um, you work paces that are just slightly slower and you're going to be working on that like endurance and power that aerobic type of power that you're going to need you work a little bit faster or a lot faster you're working on you know like getting your body accustomed to moving faster so that way your marathon pace like doesn't feel so aggressive on the legs as, as you're going so um sorry just, total rabbit hole i just wanted to mention yeah, that but it's a really know. really good point because it, i mean i think it really puts it in perspective for us right because we mm -hmm. shouldn't be running our race pace, like if we're thinking of a 5k or a 10k or, or a marathon, half marathon, we shouldn't be running those paces during our typical runs, right? Those are meant for more key workouts, quality workout sessions than our everyday training pace. I love yeah. that because I do feel like people get caught into that trap, right? Mm -hmm. I run my marathon at eight minute pace, so I run everything at eight minute pace, but that's really not, not really going to benefit us as much doing that over and over and over. It's going to break us down and a big opportunity for injury and really are not going to see the improvement that maybe we want. But I love sure. that. And, and just thinking about my kettle experience, because it was the last race that I ran, like my average pace was like a nine minute and 20 second per mile. I spent hardly any time actually like working that particular pace during my runs. I was working paces that were faster as well as I was working paces that were a lot slower because during kettle, it's like, yeah, I was busting out some like you know, six thirties and some seven minute miles. But then all of a sudden you hit the wall at Nordic and it's like, boom, I'm in my hiking zone. I'm doing like a 20 minute mile, like hiking right. up, you know what I mean? Or um, you're flying downhill and you're averaging a little bit quicker than that. Right. So right. like us ultra runners, if we get stuck in like, oh, I'm just going to go out and I'm going to like, especially us here in Illinois, it's so easy to do. Like, I'm just going to go run my, my flat, like six mile loop that I always do before work you know, I'm going to average this pace. Otherwise it, the workout wasn't worth it, you know, or I'm slacking off or whatever. Um, and it's like, no, like us ultra runners, we need to have all of those gears, not just the average gear of what the race is going to entail. Right. right? Because during our races, we're going to be hiking. So we need to be hiking and training. So, um, we're going to be running really easy. Maybe you just slammed a couple of gels or a peanut butter jelly sandwich or a bean burrito at the aid station. And you need to be efficient at just trotting it out for, you know, a quarter mile to a half a mile. Um, yes. you know, so your yep. legs need to be accustomed to like what that feels like, or Absolutely. maybe, you know, like you're feeling good, you're going downhill, you're sprinting into the finish, like your legs need to be able to pick up and go a little bit faster. Right. So during these, these structured intervals, these are all perfect times to work on all those paces. And, um, you know, just thinking about what I was thinking during this, um, during, during this interval run, I just did at the track was, yeah, maybe it's on a track. Maybe it's not specific to the next trail race that I have coming up. But like when I'm out and I'm hammering my mile repeat, my mile interval, whatever it is, like I'm hitting that pace. And then during my recovery, that recovery pace, even though it was like twice as slow as what that interval was, that's really like my hundred mile effort. So right. like when you think about the entire run as a whole, like it's like, yeah, I had my half marathon like practice during the mile repeats. And then I had my hundred mile practice during the like quote unquote, like you know, recoveries. 
So like, you know, if you just only train at one particular pace, you're not getting those faster efforts and you're not getting those slower efforts. Right. 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 So, yeah. yeah, and I, think it, I mean, I think that that's a good point because thinking about even the long runs, like, sure, if your long run is three hours, you you can maintain marathon pace, right? For three hours, you can get by on a very little nutrition and hydration for three hours, but that's not what we're training for. We're training for maybe being out there for 24 hours or 32 hours or, or 20 hours or 15 hours. So we have to be able to train our bodies to be prepared for that, right? So maybe if you are a faster runner, you still need to take breaks in your um, three-hour training run to get yourself prepared for what it's going to feel like on race day, right? And your feeling and your hydration, everything is going to need to be practiced, you know, to yeah. be able to, to maintain those paces. Oh, God. And I love, I love this topic, too, like especially with speed demons who just think they're going to fly through an entire ultra and never have to stop. Yes. Um, so when you're out and you're doing your, let's say like, you're really good. You, you consistently click off your 20 mile long runs, whatever it is like weekly, but you never stop after like 10 miles and yes. just sit for five or 10 minutes and see what it feels like for your legs to lock up and then yes. try to get going back at pace. Like you've, ne then you really haven't practiced particularly for an ultra marathon, because let me tell you, there's going to be times, even in a 50 K where most of us are going to be at a dead standstill when we're waiting at the, at the aid station for somebody to dump water over our heads, fill up our bottles, like, or you're looking for like your particular Oreo of choice or gummy worm, whatever it is, all of a sudden five or 10 minutes go by and now you got to get back going, but your legs are like locking up on yes. it. Like, <laughs> and that's not death of your race, right? Like any experienced ultra marathoner knows that like, Hey, your legs can be locked up and feel like bricks. And you can shake them out and you can feel good going down the road. But if you've never experienced that in training, because you're always clicking off just your average pace and you're always just trying to click off that, like whatever pace you think you're going to be able to hold for a 50 K or a 50 mile or a hundred mile. And you're not taking the time to go a little bit faster. So that way you can take a 10 minute break, like get your legs to lock up and then experience what it's like to try to get back at that pace. Like that, that would be a great ultra marathon specific interval right there is like, right. Hey, let's do like, if you're going to go out for a three hour run, let's do 45 minutes where you hold like whatever your race pace is and you go like 30 seconds per mile faster than that or 15 seconds per mile faster than that. And then you take 15 minutes where you go home, like you take off your shoes, you, um, you, you drink a bunch of water, maybe you have a snack. So that way, by the end of the 15 minutes, you get experience with, okay, like my legs are starting to cramp up on me, but I have to lace up my shoes because I plan on changing my shoes in the middle of an ultra. Like I just, you know, slam some water and I have something in my stomach. Now I got to go back and I got to get to that pace that is 15 seconds a mile faster than my expected pace at the ultra marathon, you know, and you do that two or three times in the course of a three hour long run. Boom. You're really training specifically for a long run because you're, you're practicing those aid station stops. Yeah. You know? One of the things that I do, I think um, we've talked about this a little before is, you know, I'll pick locations to run to. So then I have to go into the store, you know, I might go to the bathroom, get whatever I snack that sounds good or drink. And then I have to go back and get moving, you know, and that takes that. That's what happens is like, oh, those first few steps don't feel so great after, you know, you've stopped. And, and obviously you can go into the store, it's cold. So then it's, you know, it's starting over and, and getting yourself moving. So definitely something to incorporate into your long training runs is thinking about what's it going to be like on race day. Exactly. Average pace does not equal what happened inside of the workout. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Don't get hung on a, up on it. I don't even think I really look at that very often as a coach. You know, I'm looking at the more specific data that, that, you know, that we're focusing on. Agreed. Okay. My rant and rave is over. I just wanted to Yay. get that out Thanks, thanks, thanks for, for that great topic and bringing that up. And, and that's how we get topics, right? Is from some of our experiences and we also get it from our um, audience. So if you have a topic that, you know, you would like us to have a chat about on here, Feel free to shoot us an email, a message, um, and we will, you know, try to work it in or at least get your questions answered. So thanks for listening. Absolutely. And remember to like, share, subscribe, um, and keep in contact with us. We love doing these. So, you know, we would love to answer any questions that everybody has. So, um, yeah, thanks, Loretta, okay. for the conversation. Thanks for granting me another 10 minutes and um, listening to my rant and rave and um, for going on this topic with me. I think it's something that, like, you know, everybody can relate to at some point because, you know, that, that average pace per mile is so blatant on Strava whenever you look at other people's runs or your own runs and stuff like that. And like tune it out, focus on the work and focus on the goal at hand. Cause that's not reflected in your average pace. Absolutely. And again, follow us on ornery meal coaching on Facebook and Instagram.
Bye. Take care.